Okay. Okay. Um, uh, hopefully, uh, you're having a good Friday, pun intended. Uh, and that uh, probably got better when I canceled this lecture. I uh, spent the last hour and a half running around attempting to do this by the, uh, the method of uh, OneTouch Studio, but instead it's just going to be the PowerPoint presentation with, a, with an audio recording going with it. So bear with me, and uh, I will try to remember to say what screen I'm on at various times. So we're right now at the beginning of the, the lecture, where I was trying to make the emphasis that we initially looked at uh, population dynamics, and now we're looking at uh, reactor dynamics, and cell dynamics is a topic that I will not be covering this year. And primarily because this has to do with looking at like intrinsic steps of rates of, for instance, how long it takes to polymerize an amino acid, how long it takes to step down the, um, the DNA and so forth, because you can get some interesting kinetic information about, should we say, living systems if, uh, but it, it's really something that isn't all that much engineering based, so we won't do that. Um, the next slide, figure out how to advance here again. We've been through this a little bit quickly before, but I uh, wanted to emphasize that really what reactor kinetics is about is that you can take a single reactor and you can operate it in uh, multiple different ways. A batch reactor, fed batch, continuous perfusion reactor can all be run with the same basic bioreactor uh, hardware. It's a matter of how you uh, introduce the uh, nutrients to the system that defines the different modes and whether or not you retain the cells as you would do in a perfusion reactor. Um, so the next slide here, which says reactor types and operational modes, has little schematics of the cells uh, of the reactors. And it's really emphasizing the point I made in the last slide that it's all about uh, the distribution of the cells and uh, where the product and substrate are. A batch being, of course, uh, really referring to the liquid phase, because remember the gas phase is, is for the most part continuously flowing through the system, but we tend to focus predominantly on the liquid. Uh, fed batch and continuous have cells being, uh, uh, substrate being added and continuously removed, and perfusion has to do with retaining the cells inside. Uh, Semi-continuous and inter intermittent effluent have to do with, uh, for instance, if you intermittently, you can certainly add a slug of liquid every now and then, and then like take out continuously, or the opposite, you could have a pump constantly adding it in, and only take a batch of 5%, you know, er periodically as well. These are intermittent effluent uh, or semi-continuous operation. Immobilized cells is a, a specialized version where you actually take the cells and purposely uh, immobilize them into like a gel matrix, uh, little make little beads out of it, and then those cells are easy to retain within the reactor uh, as a result of that. And so the uh, uh, next slide then is uh, the one we had uh, gone through the development of this already, but just a reminder that you know, it's the same basic procedures of in accumulation equals in minus out formation consumption. I've gone through the various derivations of this, and you should look at the details. This is the rate of change of cells in the reactor, and the rate of change is always the, what you have for an accumulation term. The number of cells in the reactor is its concentration times the actual volume, and noting, as we have in, in the last assignment, that the volume can actually be changing uh, with time, or it may be constant. Being constant, of course, makes the, the problem easier. Uh, the outlet flow rate, formation rate, and also the mass balance is associated with the substrate. Each of these, it's very important that you think very clearly about what the, um, the terms of that are and, and uh, understand that from this slide. Uh, from here, we've gone through the batch. And uh, again, the batch cell balance, focusing on what's inside the parentheses here. This is essentially the number of cells or concentration of cells in the reactor is equal to the growth rate. And that makes perfect sense. It's a batch system, and so the changes in there have to do with the, the net growth of the system. And this is what ultimately gives rise to exponential growth, noting that since, uh, if you were to assume that you had a constant growth rate, then the cell balance is independent of the substrate balance. And therefore, these are totally uncoupled differential equations. So you can in integrate the cell as a function of time without actually even writing the uh, substrate balance. Uh, 
And so the substring balance also is independent, and really it just comes down to a very simple expression, and that is the yield is nothing more than the uh, amount of cells over how much sugar is consumed. That's just the definition of yield, as well as the batch. Uh, you can plug this one into there as well to actually express your growth in terms of the disappearance of the sugar, because obviously there's a constant yield between the two. Uh, going then on to the, we talked about the difference between a definition and, and an actual mass balance. Sometimes they're the same, uh, but don't get in the habit of uh, making that substitution. Uh, variable volume problem, uh, basically it's the same one as we had before. Hopefully this now uh, registers with you a little more uh, obviously, uh, since you've now worked with it hopefully in the Excel, and that is the same cell balance as we had before, where now we have assumed saturation kinetics, as opposed to uh, assuming this is a constant inside this, this bracket here. The substrate balances again is the same, okay? Uh, and in this particular case, then we need to keep track of the actual volume, so that it would be, in, in this case, uh, additions, such as in with fed batch, or evaporation. And so um, we've worked through that one as well. Um, there's a little bit of information here. This was just actually a real-time course of E. coli growth. Uh, optical density is on this axis here, and uh, so that's, this is the increase in optical density with time. Uh, and on the other axis, is the, the brown is, is the glucose. And what you can see here is that uh, during the rapid consumption of the glucose, on a log plot, you get a straight line. This is, in fact, the exponential growth period. And from that, the slope of that would actually give you the doubling time. You'll also see that once the glucose is exhausted, there is actually a, a, an actually a, a long, protracted, slower phases of growth. And this is the kind of thing that you would see when it uses other nutrients. For example, in this case, this would be media that has uh, yeast extract in it. So it also has amino acids and other things. And so it's not unusual for it to deviate then away from exponential growth and then have a, a much slower uh, kinetics as it moves between substrate limitations of different, different nutrients. Um, out here, the sugar starts to go a little bit haywire, and this is probably more an artifact of, of, of experimental measurements of glucose uh, than anything else. It's really, this is the, uh, the distinct information. This, um, if we go to the oxygen uptake rate, we'd used this uh, before. If you remember in calculating the uh, seven seconds or so that, uh, of, of dissolved oxygen that's in a reactor, and if you, you, you can see that uh, under a circumstance where, for example, the, the, uh, the, oxy the oxygen consumption rate um, can actually be calculated directly from the growth rate. So this is the XDT. This is uh, just simply growth rate again. And whereas the yield on oxygen of cells on sugar can be expressed, you can also express it as yield of cells on oxygen. So there are also conversion factors that represent uh, an ability to move between use of different substrates, not just simply sugar or glucose. Um, the thing is, is that in order to actually know this information, this is more related to the physical situation of impellers, bubbling gases in the reactors, and so forth. And we'll spend a considerable amount of time on discussing how we're going to get oxygen into the system, and the particular emphasis in the next case study is on mammalian cells where there have to be very gentle agitation. And so you have to come up with very gentle ways of getting the oxygen into the reactor. Um, mass transfer. Uh, you have seen this in, in some form or another, but it's interface gas mass transfer. And so what we have here is the oxygen transfer rate, um, which is going to be dependent on a mass transfer coefficient times an interfacial area. This is things that were very similar to the mass transfer that we had talked about um, for the uh, high fructose corn syrup, times the interfacial area per unit volume. That was basically related to the bubbles and so forth. Uh, all of this is affected by the agitation rate, input rate, and so forth. These here are the, is the driving force. This is what determines how fast it gets in given a given mass transfer coefficient. This is the equilibrium dissolved oxygen determined from Henry's law, partial pressure of oxygen, and ultimately the liquid phase uh, dissolved oxygen as well. 
uh, this transfer rate, as you can imagine, if, if you're oxygen limited, will determine dx dt. In other words, the rate of growth will now be dependent on mass transfer and not on the specific growth rate equations. So you have to know whether or not your growth rate is, is intrinsically limited, as in mu, mu max, and so forth, or whether it's transport limited. In this case, it's determined by mass transfer coefficients. And these are actually determined by correlations, much like we described before, uh, Buckingham Pi theorem and fitting of data. Uh, depending on operating conditions like agitation and stuff. We'll talk about that, uh, I think, a lot more. Uh, just a few comments in here that make some, give you some idea of how it makes sense. The um, liquid mass transfer coefficient, KL, is what is dependent upon things that uh, are largely like a diffusion coefficient, if you will. It, it's dependent on the molecule. Uh, and uh, a lot to, to, uh, um, is, is not de that dependent on the interfacial area per volume because that's determined by the agitation speed. In very simple terms, A is interfacial area per unit volume, and if you look over here at the bubbles, of course, if I break the bubbles up into tiny bubbles, it is very easy to then increase the mass transfer coefficient Reality is, is we really don't know what KLA, KL is, and we also don't know what A is, and when you multiply two things you don't know together, it's easier to just refer to them as one unknown. So KLA is almost always just simply described as a combined unknown constant, and, and, and so its functional dependence is then simply fit by taking experimental data and measuring it, and uh, that'll be dependent on things like the impeller RPM speed, uh, things like that. We'll determine that from correlations. Um, this one here is showing that you know under under oxygen limiting conditions, the oxygen transfer rate is equal to the uh, KLA, and the only thing that you can do is you can actually adjust this dissolved oxygen. This would be like the set point, uh, and when I keep that number. Um, well, let's put it this way. If, if I allowed my, if I wanted my concentration to be close to 100% in my reactor, then the difference would be very, very small. It would be actually be very hard to get more oxygen in, in the system. Whereas if I let this go to zero, that would represent the maximum rate at which I can transport oxygen into the system. And ultimately for us, the important thing is when the demand is equal to the supply, that is the transfer rate, uh, that's what will determine uh, when you are the rate of growth when you're oxygen limited. Um, taking a look then again at that time course that we had seen before, this is actually on this axis is dissolved oxygen. Uh, it was close to 100%, 100% dissolved oxygen. And remember, it's a percentage of equilibrium. So this turns out that this number is about six parts per million, so it's actually not that much. Uh, and then as they start to grow rapidly, that dissolved oxygen drops. Once it actually becomes limiting, okay, and you have the controller come on, the remainder of the growth actually is now being controlled largely by the transport of oxygen and not by the doubling time of the organism. So this is kind of a classic transition substrate limited kinetics. And then at this point, uh, mass transfer limited kinetics. I'm um, not sure what happened there. Uh, maybe nothing. Let's see. Okay. Um, an important aspect of sort of like thinking about how you're modeling uh, or, or predicting how fast uh, you're going to make money running your reactor, something is going to be limiting. You're either going to run out of nutrients or you'll run out of oxygen uh, at some point. And so as a result, this is sort of one of the fundamental reasons why it would be nice to have a way to continue to add more nutrients in there because an oxygen limitation allows them to continue to grow. A nutrient limitation means they stop. And so Fed Batch gives you a way of continuing to add nutrients and continuing to grow them to a higher cell density. Um, so Fed Batch reactor, not that sophisticated. We still have our box, but now we have an input. That input is added during the actual run itself. That means the volume of the tank is going to increase. And so you need to know the time-dependent volume increase, as well as the concentration of what you're putting into the, into the nutrient feeds.
The sale balance here is uh, is uh, pretty simple. Again, I mean, there's uh, there's no cells in your feed stream, so it doesn't affect it, right? You just have an accumulation term, and you have a growth term. So it's the same as it was in the batch. The substrate balance, however, now is is different because not only do you have the accumulation term, but now you actually have sugar in the feed, and that feed concentration you have to be careful to keep it separate. It is not the same as this s. It's the actual feed concentration and the flow rate into that. And then this is the term that you had in the, uh, in the other uh, equation. So uh, with that in mind now, uh, you also have a total mass balance where the, uh, the change, the rate of change or accumulation here uh, is equal to the flow rate, assuming of course there was a density here and a density there as well. And so it turns out that you can actually integrate this uh, because you could integrate uh, dxv over xv and it would be log xv. Um, I don't like to get too hung up in special cases because of course that won't always work uh, in a circumstance where you have um, other complexities. It's just this one simple case where that, 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 is, uh, that is possible. Um, so uh, I'll just read from the screen here about the fed batch reactor. In a fed batch reactor, the cell growth rate can be controlled using the feed uh, to keep the substrate concentration at a at a uh, at a reduced value. In other words, if you want to minimize your or, or slow the growth down, uh, sometimes that actually actually helps the productivity of the product that you're trying to do, and so uh, you can actually then prevent it from experiencing oxygen limitation and that can be very important because you don't want the cells to go anaerobic because when cells go anaerobic physiologically they're very very different this is kind of like when you go running and you have the uh, um, you know lactic acid build up in your in your legs uh, so by feeding substrate that's one way in which you can control uh, the status of your cells uh, and prevent anaerobic metabolism, which is often and usually bad for productivity. Um, there, in turn, if you can imagine, you can, you can now run the flow rate into there in any way you want to. So there's a lot of different ways to run a fed batch. Uh, the one that we had given was just a constant flow rate. Uh, so, but that flow rate could be any functional dependence that you want. It could most logically ramp up with time as there's more and more cells and you could actually increase it with time. Uh, it's obviously very easy to do a steady feed. Um, if F is equal to a constant, that's the problem. An exponential feed would mean where you actually increase the flow rate exponentially with time. And as you can imagine, if you do that in just the right way, uh, you could actually keep uh, it from changing. You could actually make it like a, a constant environment. Um, and so that's the result of integrating an exponential feed. Uh, or you could actually control it on, on residual substrate. And so you just say you wanted to actually maintain a certain sugar concentration that was in there. If you have a probe, like a refractive index would measure sugar, you could actually then feedback control a pump that would allow you to add on demand. Um, and so here you're not really specifying immediately the, uh, the function uh, with time, but actually controlling it based on, on uh, the response that the reactor gives. Uh, another way to do it is actually to control it on dissolved oxygen. And so you can actually, when the dissolved oxygen gets too low, you can please stop feeding them as much sugar. And then of course, if they can't use that sugar for respiration, then they will stop eating the oxygen and so you can then control it based on, on dissolved oxygen. So these are all different ways in which you can actually run it. Uh, there's an analysis here. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. I used to do this uh, probably a little more than I, than I needed to. Uh, but each one of these scenarios has a different way in which you go through the mathematics. Uh, if F is a, a constant, okay, you can go through and what you'll see, of course, is it makes sense. If I'm substrate limited and I feed it at a steady rate, then dx dt should be pretty much a constant. And so as a result of that, they're actually, each cell is slowing down its growth. It's another example of true linear growth. Um, there's more cells in there, but each cell, when there's you know, many more cells, they each are individually sl growing slower because with time, the actual mass is, 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 is actually going up uh, so down here. 
proportional. So dx dt is equal to an actual constant. Uh, as I mentioned, this is good for preventing uh, anaerobic metabolism. Uh, a little bit of mathematics here. It's just, this is all nice. You can go through and say that given that steady feed, you can get nifty expressions that'll tell you your sugar concentration is a function of your, your flow rates and so forth if you have a target. Um, the strategy of maintaining um, having an exponential feed um, is, is a way of uh, not requiring a control leap. In other words, you don't have to measure anything. You just simply set up a pump and that pump will slowly increase with time. And in fact, if any of you know electronics, uh, it's actually quite easy to have an exponential circuit because all it is is something that, like, a, like a 555 timer chip and that timer chip just simply can go 2, then 4, then 8. That's actually pretty easy to do. Uh, in a, an electrical circuit, and then that electrical voltage output would then drive your pump uh, in an exponential way. Um, so with that in mind, then, if you have an exponential volume change with time, and then you take that and you plug it into your actual exponential growth curve, remember that these are, are decoupled, you can see that what will happen is you'll actually have an exponential increase, of course, in your, in your volume. Um, and so, again, there's some, there's some easy forms for doing the integration of this that give you explicit ones, but I'm, I'm not really emphasizing explicit integration in this course. And it's super easy to do it with numerical integration, so why would you bother? Um, an interesting thing about it is you can actually maintain a specific growth rate below the maximum value. So you could actually keep mu at a constant rate, but that constant rate will not be its maximum growth rate. So this would be very useful to, for trying to assess, for example, if your product formation is dependent on the rate of growth by actually really growing them at different growth rates by setting your pump value to different set points as well. Uh, control C is basically, uh, this is the control on residual substrate. Um, you know from kinetics, the saturation kinetics, that in this little red box here, that if my substrate concentration is, is close to Ks, then I'm not going to be um, limiting uh, things uh, for, for the uh, uh, gr uh, growth. You're, you're operating uh, just below saturation. Uh, this entire approach to trying to control a substrate means you're going to have to have a probe that can measure your substrate concentration. So to be honest, most times this is not actually used because those probes are not all that accurate. Um, there are some cases. Oxygen probes, on the other hand, are almost always in reactors. And since we have that as a control parameter, this is actually used quite a bit. And, and since it's very, you know, cells care whether or not they're anaerobic or not, making sure that they don't go anaerobic, this is the easy way to do it. You just simply don't give them sugar if they're eating too fast. And as a result of that, it's just a feedback control loop. And if they're growing too fast, then you give them less sugar. If they're not growing fast enough, you add more. And so it's an easy way to actually run a thing. It's a very common way to run a fed batch uh, based on DO control. Continuous culture is where I'm going to probably, I'll, I'll finish up uh, the, the thoughts here. And I mentioned this before, and this is probably one of the most important aspects of, of this lecture, is to understand that if you could go to continuous, where you have a continuous amount of product coming out, continuous addition, this is where you can actually increase the productivity of a reactor by an order of magnitude, i.e. not make $10 an hour, but instead make $100 an hour. And the reason is, is that you can now run this instead of going through a batch where you're making no money in the beginning to at the end when you get to harvest it at one every now and again. Uh, a continuous reactor is always giving you as much as it possibly can all the time. And so that's why we tend to take batch processes for chemical process industry and try to make them uh, continuous. And so you have continuous substrate addition, and you have a product uh, the flow in is equal to the flow out, and your product is also coming out. Your volume is constant as well, so the mathematics of this, it turns out, are really quite simple. Uh, we'll get to that in a minute. First, I just want to go to the approach, the dynamics to steady state. Um, the steady state mass balance is accumulation equals zero. <laughs> okay, so dx dt equals zero. 
And under that circumstance, you can prove very quickly that the specific growth rate is just simply equal to the pump setting divided by the volume. So this is a really unique thing where you can decide how fast you want them to grow just by deciding the flow rate, nothing more, once you know have a, a tank of a certain volume. So once it reaches that steady condition, then it doesn't change with time. There's a whole lot of advantages. Not only are you always making product all the time, okay, but it turns out also then the conditions aren't changing. So you don't have to really respond or be worrying that too much about controllers failing and so forth. You just let it rip and money's coming out in the bucket. Um, so that being the case, then there's some additional analysis that's kind of classic uh, related to continuous operation. Uh, this is just some statements that, in fact, it's the most efficient way to produce that. And uh, the problem is, is that if you run continuously, if you could become contaminated or something goes wrong, uh, you have to start over completely. Um, here's the little derivation accumulation term uh, equals is zero. And if the accumulation is steady state is zero, then you have the uh, output rate, that is minus the output rate here and the growth rate, and then it's just simple mathematics, your ends go out, and your growth rate is equal to, it turns out, your dilution rate. Makes sense. You have to replace your cells as fast as you dilute them out of the system. And your substrate balance then gives you an equation that tells you that the uh, difference between in and out is equal to how much they ate. Nothing, no rocket science here, uh, but it gives you some basic equations to know uh, what productivities you're going to have. This one in particular is kind of interesting because it tells you what your steady state substrate tends in and cell density is. So once you run this system, you're, you have a specific growth rate is equal to your dilution rate and you can control specific growth rate. Uh, I've mentioned this and that the steady state is reached because um, the cells remain uh, in the reactor longer and they have more of the substrate is, is in, okay, let me just read that. Um, steady state in the reactor is, is reached because the cells remain in the reactor longer and they use more of the continuous flow. This reduces the functionally the growth rate, which also then means that the substrate levels during continuous operation are actually pretty low. In fact, they have to be low. They have to be close to the K value for the uh, kinetics. Um, now, this is only true as long as the, your pump isn't too high. If you try to pump them too fast and you're, they can't grow that fast, then it's what's referred to as washed out. I, the only steady state there is, is that there's no cells left in the reactor. Um, you can actually, these equations here give us this ability to plot a graph to show how that, what, what happens at different dilution rates. Remember, your dilution rate is how fast your pump is pumping. And so you can see that this is your steady state cell density, and this is a steady state, I'm sorry, so steady state cell density, and this is the steady state sugar concentration, if you want to think about that. And so they're only really dependent on your feed concentration and your pump flow rates. All the rest are kinetic parameters. Now, if you graph these, what you're going to see is, is a behavior where uh, as I increase my dilution rate, at some point, my, my, my pump, my dilution rate is so high that all of the cells get blown out of the reactor, okay? And that's referred to as, as washout here. So the maximum growth rate tells you that you can't dilute the system any faster than that. And you can see that under most circumstances, almost all the sugar is used. And then only once I start to blow the cells out of the reactor, do I actually then have the sugar concentration go to the point where once it washes out, of course, it, what goes out comes in because there's no cells left in the reactor. Um, this is a little analysis to try to translate the uh, information to money. Okay? If I actually go back, which I'm not sure I can do here, if you think about it, at a really low dilution rate, you might be making, uh, you might be ha uh, using all of your substrate. But if your flow rate is so low, you can't be making much money. If I start out up to here, eventually I get to the point where I I'm running at a really high flow rate, but I'm not using any of my substrate. So you can kind of guess before I do this next analysis that if I was going to look at how much money I'm going to make, it's going to start at zero, because if I don't have a dilution rate, I don't make any money. And it's going to end at zero because if I blow all the cells out. And so this is actually going to be a bell-shaped curve where there's money maximum in the middle. 
classic engineering problem, right? Find the peak, and we want to operate our dilution rate where we're going to make the most money. How do we do that? Well, we go to calculus, and here's where I don't get a chance, unfortunately, to embarrass anybody, of how do you use calculus to find a maximum? And the answer is you take a second derivative, and that second derivative, if it is uh, negative, is a minimum. If it's positive, it's a maximum. I'll give you a mnemonic so you never forget that. Um, but at any rate, I need to know what my money is going to be. It's going to be my cells that come out, my flow rate out. Well, I just take that st equation for x steady state, I plug it into there, I get an equation. I now just simply take the derivative of this, set that derivative equal to zero, and then that gives me the maximum dilution rate where I make the most money. And so here's the plot of productivity as a function of dilution rate. Starts at zero, goes up, comes back down again. And so you can kind of imagine that your job as an engineer is to find the pump flow rate that makes the most money. And it turns out you might not actually be here because that might be standing too close to the cliff. You might actually want to be back here where you have yourself a little buffer room so that if something bad happens, you don't fall off the cliff and make no money. Uh, this is, you know, even not, this isn't even exaggerated. It's usually even a little steeper cliff on this side. And so at any rate, that's how you would define the maximum productivity for uh, a continuous system. Um, I think at this point, uh, I'm going to go ahead and stop the lecture. Uh, I'll pick up uh, next time with just a few comments on it and a few um, loose ends on, on the kinetics before we go to the next part, which is actually reactor design. That's it.